Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 19th, 2016, and my guest is David Beckworth of Western Kentucky University. We are taping this in front of a live audience at the Cato Institute, where David is an adjunct scholar, and this event is part of Cato's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. David, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me on. Now, you've written a lot of provocative things about the Great Recession, the role of the Fed, uh, and trying to understand what happened. So that's going to be our main focus today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into a lot of other related issues. Uh, a lot of people blame the collapse of the housing market for the Great Recession and see that they may disagree about whose fault that is, whether it's the government or the private sector uh, run amok. I always like that phrase. But uh, you don't think that's the central factor. So what, first, what is their argument and why do, you, why do you disagree? Well, the standard story is that we had a housing boom, a run up in housing credit. Households became over levered. Um, and another part of the story is that maybe government policies helped facilitate that. Maybe the Fed kept rates too low for too long. Um, and that generated this buildup of excesses that eventually had to be corrected. So there had to be, almost be a bust. It was inevitable. Um, then on top of that, there's another story that's tied into this is that a, a, a bank run occurred, a financial panic. Um, and while I acknowledge all those things happen, and some of my co-authors have written with me, we acknowledge those things happen. We don't think those things would have created the Great Recession. We believe there would have been a mild recession, a run-of-the-mill recession, but to get to a great recession, you needed to have the Federal Reserve make some policy mistakes in 2008. And we believe it did a, a series of mistakes. So I like, I like your explanation. I'm drawn to it because I was one of the people who said that in the, as the housing market was expanding uh, a lot, I said, well, that's nothing to worry about. It's a small part of the U.S. economy. Uh, it can't really wreak the havoc that that people are saying, or some people, very few, but a few people were, mm-hmm. were saying, and people would say, are you worried about it? And I'd say no. So I was wrong, I think, but you say, oh, actually, I was, I was right on the mark. It wasn't, wasn't a housing problem. It's, so that's a great comfort to me, but uh, I'm, I'm worried that I might actually have been wrong. It, it, it's happened many times. So why, what's wrong with that argument? I mean, it's, it's clearly the case, as you, as you concede, that housing prices went up a lot, Mm -hmm. A huge amount of construction, expansion of employment in that area, a huge amount of leveraged financial bets made on housing through the securitization market, and and a collapse, really, of the so-called shadow banking system, which should have had, I would have thought, disastrous repercussions, now that I understand something about leverage in the financial system, which I didn't. What's wrong with that story? Again, just to repeat, we think there would have been a recession, it's just the severity of it. Um, to answer that, let's go back to 2006. So in about April 2006, the national average, so there's regional differences, but the national average, housing prices begin to fall about that time. If you look at indicators related to housing industry, so employment, if you look at income, any construction, real estate, they're all declining sharply after that point. So the housing sector and those really close to it are declining for about two years before you get to the actual blow up in about mid to late 2008. So the Federal Reserve, uh, the UN, the US economy is doing relatively well for almost two years. There's a sectoral recession going on. Housing is slowly going down. Um, So something changed in 2008. Uh, Also, the the early financial run. So there was panic in 2007, particularly beginning about August 2007, when BNP Paribas, a bank in France, didn't allow people to withdraw funds from an investment fund there, and then later Bear Stearns in early 2008. But all up to that period, all the way up to about early, mid-2008, the U.S. economy is doing relatively well. So if you looked at employment outside of construction-related industries and housing industries, employment actually grows up until early to mid-2008. Personal income growth grows until early to mid-2008. Some kind of catalyst had to step in and, and, and make it spread and become a truly systemic event. Um, and, you know, as, as a monetary economist, I naturally think, well, it's got to be related to money somehow. What's the one asset on every market? 
on every transaction. It's money. If you want to simultaneously mess up an entire economy, somehow affect the demand or supply for money, and we believe that happened. I believe that happened uh, during that time due to the Fed's inactions and a number of other mistakes. So let's just go back to the timing, uh, which is a little bit tricky because it okay. was so long ago. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, it, it's actually a decade ago we're talking about, which hard is to hard believe. to believe because yeah. some of us feel like we haven't quite escaped it. But um, as you point out, and I went back and looked at the data before this interview, the housing market starts to slow in 2006. Mm-hmm. The official NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, start of the recession is December of 2007. The crisis part of it, which they didn't note at the time, in December 2007, nobody said, oh my gosh, we're in a recession. This is ex post dating of the problem. The crisis begins in March of 2008, you could argue with Bear Stearns, but they, the, the Fed covers that up with its mm-hmm. making sure that its creditors are taken care of. I thought that was a mistake, but put that to the side. It's really the fall of 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and a set of other problems, um, runs on uh, money market funds, et cetera, that really create this feeling of so-called panic that caused Hank Paulson to go to Congress and say, the world's going to come to an end. And as John Taylor and others have pointed out, actually dating it to the Lehman Brothers collapse is kind of hindsight because really the economy didn't fall off a cliff. There wasn't real panic. Um, so what you're arguing, if, let, me, so let me try to summarize that and try to say what I think you're saying. You're saying that, yeah, there was a recession. Like many other recessions, housing market led, meaning occurred before it happened. It's not uncommon. In fact, almost every recession of the 20th century began with some kind of housing problem, whether that's because housing is special or housing's the most important asset on most people's personal balance sheets. That's, that's standard stuff. We would have had a mild recession. Yes, it started December 2007, but something then happened that made 2008, late 2008 going forward, disastrous. The, the largest downturn in economic activity since the Great Depression. So what was that if it wasn't the repercussions of the housing market? Let me get back to you in just a minute. I wanted to follow up. You your, change your, my timeline? Well, I, I, I want to put it. I love your timeline. It's perfect. <laughs> um, but, but just to mention, to, to support this timeline um, you've laid out, Ben Bernanke famously has a video on YouTube where he says everything's under control. And they show that through time. You probably have seen it. And people like to use it to make fun of Ben Bernanke. But, but to be fair to him, you know, and what my analysis suggests is up until early 2008, that was the proper thing to say. Things were looking like a manageable, you know, slowdown in activity. Um, as a counterexample, Australia, they had just as much run up in public, in, I'm sorry, in household debt. They had a housing bubble, all the same problems we had, but they never went through a great recession. They, they went through relatively fine. In fact, they haven't had a recession since 1991. And that recession was a mild one like, like we had. Their, their great moderation never ended. That could be because they have kangaroos. Probably. No, I mean, it's, causation is very hard to tease out there, <laughs> yeah. right? So the question would be, are there other countries beside Australia mm-hmm. that either had very moderate There's another- crises? Canada, for example, I think had a milder one. Yeah, I'm not, they may have. I'm not sure about Canada, but Israel did as well. Correct. Israel had a relatively um, mild uh, slowdown. Um, and what they did, in, in my view, is their central bank acted more aggressively. They took the steps that were needed to curtail the, the panic and the fear that set in. So your, your question is, what did the Fed do wrong? Well, I see three things um, the Fed did wrong. And George Selgin, who's here, he's written on some of this. But the first thing I think where they went wrong is they did sterilized lending in 2007. So about from September 2007 or so, uh, maybe it's August 2007, up until... Uh, near the end of 2008, when they began QE, they did sterilized quantitative lending. Quantitative easing. Yeah, quantitative easing. They did sterilized lending, which meant they lent, what is that? They lent money out to certain banks. But for every dollar they lent out, they also sold a treasury, which pulled money out. So for every dollar they injected, they were also pulling a, a dollar out, which meant overall liquidity was staying flat. Now imagine, again, this is again 2007, and, and again, things were not too bad, but it was still an elevated sense of uh, financial risk which means the demand for liquidity had to be up. But all the Fed was doing was targeting specific banks, specific institutions. Not the economy as a whole. Not the economy as a whole. And that's what it should have been. That's that's the first place where it went wrong, in in my view. Now, again, I don't think it was was catastrophic. That was the biggest mistake. The biggest mistake, but it was the beginning. 
of a series of mistakes. The bigger one, in my view, begins in early 2008. Um, the federal funds rate had been dropped from about five and a quarter to two and a quarter from, so I think, September 2007 to about April 2008. It dropped quite a bit. And I think the Fed was on the right path. But once we get to April, the, they hold the federal funds rate, their target interest rate, at 2% from April all the way through October, the early part of October. And I counted it out. It's five months and one week. Okay. So about five months, they, they, they keep it steady, all right? At Having dropped it dramatically. Dropped it dramatically. Just as a clarification, yeah. federal funds rate is? It's the overnight rate at which banks lend to each other. And it's, it's the rate, at least prior to the crisis, that the Fed targeted and they intervened in uh, to guide monetary policy. Nowadays, it's, they've got a few other rates they look at. But it was the indicator of the stance of monetary policy. So they lowered interest rates in presumably in cons- under concern that things they were did. not going well. And then they kept them there. What was wrong with that? Well, they stopped. They, they were on the right path, and they stopped in, early, in April 2008. They were concerned about inflation. Now, I've had a lot of pushback. Well, what's 2%? What's the big deal about 2%? And, and the analogy I... Meaning, uh, as opposed to one Big zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How much more difference would it have made had the Fed gone from 2% to zero? And I think a, a lot of difference. It's, it's a nonlinear or nonproportional effect. You know, what's the difference between a sick person getting an antibiotic shock and a healthy person? A big difference. You know, if you have pneumonia, that antibiotic shock may be the difference between life and death. If you're healthy, no big deal. And so I think when they got to that point, it was pivotal that they, they continue to cut rates. Moreover, it's not just the level of the interest rate. It's, it's where it should be in order to, to make the economy well again. And we call this the natural interest rate, but I like, to, I like to label it the market clearing rate. Where would rates need to be in order for markets to clear? And, Which markets? Well, as a whole, the, the U.S. economy as a whole to, to clear. So I'm kind of using that term loosely there. But, but in general, what would, what would households need, where would rates need to be for households and for businesses to allocate their spending across time? Um, to bring the economy back to full employment or to keep it healthy. And, and when the economy weakens, it, it pulls that rate, that market clearing rate down, which we call the natural rate. It's the rate based on the fundamentals. Imagine there's no Federal Reserve. Where would, that, where would, the mark, where would market forces push, push interest rates? And they were going down rapidly. So we're really, you're really talking about the supply and demand for credit. Yeah, the simple uh, loanable funds model, you can think of that. Savings and investment come together, that, that magic spot. That was falling quickly, and yet the Fed held rates at 2%. So what's, why does that – the first question would be, let's forget about the sort of complex role the monetary policy plays in the economy because – uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But So the Fed holds their rate that the banks charge each other higher than what would be the clearing rate for the economy as a whole. Why? Why is? What's the consequence of that? Well, let me let me add to that. It's that was the first mistake. There's the, let me answer your question in a minute. Let me follow up okay. with with that observation. Not only did they keep it at two, and so that clearing rate was falling, they signaled they were going to increase rates. And that's almost more important than where the current rate is. In fact, you know, the, the, the way, probably the proper way to look at monetary policy is where is the Fed going to go in the future? And if you look at the federal funds rate futures contract, so there's a contract you can buy that will lock in a federal funds rate, and you can you know, get that, lock that rate in, and someone will have to lend to you at that particular rate in the future. So these are for people who have skin in the game, or these are real monies at stake here. That got as high as 3.5% in June 2008. So it started in April. Not only did they stop at the, the actual rate at 2, but starting in April, that rate, the, the forward rate begins to go up and up. And by June 2008, it hits 3.5%. Because people are expecting an increase based on the Fed's they are. And, talk. And, right. Let me be clear. That's a one-year-ahead forecast. So the market was expecting a year in, in advance that Fed funds would be at 3.5%. Now, why, why were they expecting this? Because the Fed was really talking up its concerns about inflation. So there were some commodity price shocks. Um, the price level, inflation was going higher because of a temporary disturbance from, from the demand for commodities. And, and that was driving up prices. Um, and so they, they, were, they were, in my view, too focused on that. And they kind of took their eye off the, the other part, the, where the real economy was going. And, and if you go back and read their minutes, um, even as late as September 2008... If you go read their statement that was released, they, they state explicitly they were just as concerned about inflation as they were the real economy. They were, they were, they were worried about this. And if you go back and read the transcripts, it's the, some of them in the August meeting, they were predicting the next meeting there would be a rate hike. 
So this is, again, things are blowing up around August, September, and they're thinking of rate hikes. So that allowed panic to even grow, to fester. If, if you think the Fed is going to tighten and there's a run on the shadow banking system, a run on wholesale lending, um, mortgages are beginning you know, to, to default, all these problems are emerging, it, it's, it's, you know, it's taking that sick patient, not pulling this, the antibiotic shot away from them. So your claim is that by failing... They made an error, some errors of commission. Absolutely. But this is really an error of omission. Mm-hmm. There's a commission piece to it, right? The omission is they should have been lowering rates further. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they, the commission part was they were encouraging people to think that in the future they were going to raise rates. In the near future, they were going to raise rates. And you're arguing this um, effectively tightened money. Yes. So, again, probably the best way to think about the stance of monetary policy is what is the Fed going to do over the next six months, over the next year. We, we've seen this recently. I mean, the Fed has, beginning in mid-2014, it talked up interest rates. Did it, until it said, any day now we're going to get out of this. We might be they did. It might, the economy might be healthy enough. We might be able to raise rates soon. And, and they, they talked, talked, talked it up. And what happened is... They the, didn't do anything. Yeah. Well, they, did, <laughs> they didn't, but it had an effect. If you look at the dollar, the dollar rose over 20% between mid-2014 and the end of 2015 when they finally did raise rates. And, and that, that sudden increase in the dollar had huge repercussions for the global economy because a lot of countries are pegged to the dollar or are closely tied in some function to the dollar. So the Fed simply talking up rates, forward guidance, all that has an effect today because, you know, if, if you think you're going to lose your job in the future, today you're going to make changes in your spending plans and your savings plans. And that's, that's kind of the, the idea here. So... Ben Bernanke mm-hmm. concedes, which is rare, which is a fantastic thing. You have to give him a lot of credit for. He has Absolutely. conceded, maybe he didn't have a choice, but he has conceded that that was a mistake over that, that five-month period, correct? Yes, in his book. In his book, which is unusual. Well, usually... I, I know he's conceded about the September okay. 2008 FOMC. Okay. I'm not sure about before then. Right. But certainly he's that. conceded that, that, that they should have lowered rates and they shouldn't have been worried about inflation. Right. And they shouldn't have talked up that they were probably going to raise rates Soon, correct, right? right? So he would, so he's conceded that, but he would not concede. I'm pretty confident that that really created the the um, severity of the crisis. So, what would his argument be? What would he say to you? Would he say just, well, sure, they should have been a little lower. We shouldn't have encouraged talk that we were going to be raising rates, maybe. But that wasn't that. What that isn't the real side of the economy. The real side of the economy is that. The construction sector is collapsing. Banks are still going to have problems. It's not, it wouldn't have changed. It wouldn't have changed the thing. Important. What, what would you respond to that? Well, again, I would go back to this idea. There's these nonlinear effects. That yes, we're, we're going to go into a mild recession, um, but but to go, to, you know, to have the, the gradual decline suddenly, you know, almost on a dime, go, you know, sharply up the intensity, the the TED spread, all these things that indicated something fundamentally changed in 2008. Um, break-evens, which is the difference between uh, what a treasury bond, and nominal treasury bond, the interest rate on that, versus a TIPS, which is an inflation protected. If you look at the difference between those, that is the expected inflation rate that comes from bonds market. In any event, that begins to nosedive in the summer of 2008. So it's, there, there's something that happens, and, and Bernanke would need to convince me that, that his actions, which clearly time-wise line up, you know, the Fed's actions line up with this sudden turn for the worse, had to be attributed to something else. I mean, it, it could be that people just suddenly panicked and freaked out more. Um, but at the best case story he can say is, well, we just, you know, we didn't stop it. I mean, the best case scenario I would say from Ben Bernanke is he is a school crossing guard, you know, the, the child's crossing, the economy's crossing in front of an oncoming car, and he stops and doesn't do anything. That's the best case scenario. Um, but I think the timing is, is, is a hard one for him to make. So we'll come back later maybe uh, to this question of what the Fed should and shouldn't do. But uh, I'm going to ask you a tough question, which is I didn't hear a lot of people at the time saying that we're about – that the Fed is making a major mistake here that's going to plunge the economy into, a, into the worst recession since 19, the 1930s. So to me, as an outsider, and I, you know, I've confessed on the air, I love this story. It's for a lot of reasons. One I mentioned earlier, but also just wouldn't it be great to have a simple key to the economy, a simple knob or dial that we could turn and this could be it. So I, I think we have a natural inclination to want it to be true. <clears throat> but the question is, is this just the next post narrative? I mean, this is 
Like the next time this happens, you, are you now smarter? Did you not know this before? Is this something you figured out after watching this and now the next time it's about to happen, you'll know? Which, and to put it in historical perspective, uh, I think it was 2003 maybe or 2000 at a monetary conference that Bernanke with Friedman in the audience said, Professor Friedman, don't worry, we read your book, The Monetary History of the United States, we'll never make this mistake again. And you're saying he did. And the question I have is, what's the good of, first of all, it, I'm not sure it's true that he made the mistake, but my second is, if it is true, how could he make it again? And how could you and others standing on the side of the not like pick at the Federal Reserve and say you're about to destroy the economy and make the same mistake you said you'd never make? Well, to be fair, this is Monday morning quarterbacking. I'll <laughs> completely confess. Okay. I think Honest I, man. I, I think I, I was caught off guard too. Uh, there were some things that really shocked me in 2000, late 2008, um, and, I, and I've had this on my blog as evidence. But when they they imposed interest on reserves, um, I, I thought at the time when this they did what they they put interest on reserves. Yeah. Um, I thought that was that's when it really hit me that they were going the other direction. In fact, I was I was uh, I had a I think my one of my first posts. I criticized the Fed for being too easy. So my views actually changed. I've, I've learned a lot in this crisis. I'll, I'll okay. confess. So, but I, but, but I, I do think it's important to learn from history. Just like Friedman and Schwartz, I mean, their their understanding of the Great Depression wasn't the, the current understanding at the time of the Great Depression, even a decade after. It takes time to learn from our mistakes. So now we have two data points. So we're getting the hang of it. <laughs> we're, we're slowly. And I, I would say part of the efforts I have made, uh, Scott Sumner, even George Selgin, is we do need a better measure, indicator, better approach to monetary policy. And we can talk about this later. But, but if, they, if they've been looking at things, again, forward-looking asset prices like break-evens, um, but even things like nominal GDP targeting, total dollar spending, it was beginning to slow down. Um, but we, maybe we can save that conversation for later. But I, but I want to be fair. This is Monday morning, morning quarterbacking on my part. But I, I do think it's important we do this to, to see where they made these mistakes and hopefully nudge policy in a better direction. I just want to put a plug in here for, for bias. Hmm. When you're biased and you have a pet theory, it does encourage you to go out and find evidence for it. Then you can assess whether... Well, is this like the worst case of cherry picking of all time? Or is this like, wow, I never, I hadn't thought to look for that. Now that I've had the inclination to find it and I have found it, does that encourage me to take my ideological priors maybe a little more seriously? And if I don't find it or if it's really hard to find or if the case is kind of far fetched. Yeah. So the question, you know, one obvious question at this point is it's an interesting approach. It hasn't convinced Ben Bernanke. It, there is a growing number of folks, who, I think, which is interesting, who are worried about the factors you're talking about, in particular looking at nominal spending, nominal GDP as a measure of the health of the economy or as a guide to monetary policy. But it, you've struggled to convince uh, the skeptics that this is decisive. Is that a fair assessment? That is fair. Um, and that's why I continue to plot away. <laughs> um, but if you look at even Bernanke's own work prior to joining the Fed, he, he did work on Japan. And he acknowledged a couple, a couple of places. He said, you know, nominal GDP is a, and, and inflation are, are two measures together you should look at. Um, when he got inside the Fed, you know, e- even if everyone in the Fed or the Board of Governors adopted my view, it's a big institution. It takes time to change their, their views. It, you can't you know, stop a ship quickly and turn it around. So I, I think the, the game plan is it's maybe to educate and help understand better what's going on. Um, but, but even in the Fed, they had a discussion in Bernanke's book about nominal GDP targeting. Some of them liked it, but they thought it was too difficult, kind of midstream, to, to change horses and go into something like nominal GDP tar- targeting. So at the heart of your story is a puzzle, I think, for most listeners, um, which is that interest rates are not the best guide to the tightness or looseness of monetary policy, but rather... Yes the relative uh, magnitude of interest rates to uh, a so-called natural rate that would, that would uh, say, clear the credit market. Um, In real time, almost impossible, well, always impossible to know what that natural rate really is. Is it then the case that this idea is not a very actionable policy guide to the, for the Fed? And in particular, it seems like an awfully difficult policy guide. And it raises the related question, which is, does the Fed really have control over interest rates? I think they act like they do. Some people believe they do. A lot of people, you would be one of them, are skeptical about that. So why don't you start there? What control, if any, does the Fed have over interest rates? And then if it, if it does not, which I think you're going to conclude, 
how is it possible to find that natural rate to avoid these kind of either bubbles being created or burst based on mistakes? Okay, so it is difficult to know what the natural interest rate is in real time. There are attempts, though. There have been people who attempt to measure it. Even the Federal Reserve has their own internal estimates of what that short-term natural rate is. There's also what they call medium terms, and, and different people have released these measures. Um, but they're all estimates with wide standard errors, and they all acknowledge, you know. So I, I do think it's difficult. Um, but given we have central banks that target interest rates, it, it's still useful to have some kind of benchmark. So Janet Yellen, in a recent speech late last year, released a figure that showed her the, the, some estimate from the Board of Governors that provided like a point estimate of it with these bands of confidence that are pretty wide. And, and it better safe than sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but even with those, you can see it's, it, it was negative and it's slowly going up. At a minimum, it'd be nice to have the, the Fed report those and say, here's where the federal funds rate is. Here's where we think the market clearing the natural rate is. But it's, there's always going to be a, I agree, there's always going to be a question, which then leads me back to why I would actually go to something like nominal GDP targeting, um, maybe alter the monetary base. But maybe we can save that conversation for later. But back to your question on does the Fed control interest rates? Well, it has some influence in the short term over rates. I mean, I've, I've argued, along with George Selgin in a paper recently, that we think that the Fed did keep rates below, the short term really, for a little bit below the natural rate in the early to mid 2000s, and that added fuel to the fire of the housing crisis. But over the long run, it, it does, I think it has very limited control. If the Federal Reserve cares about inflation, then it's going to have to follow the natural rate. The natural rate is, is, is kind of, again, this market-driven clearing value for interest rates. And if you want to have price stability or aggregate demand, nominal spending stability, you're going to have to follow, wherever that goes, the Fed's going to have to implicitly follow that. Um, and I think that's very evident in the last seven years. So in the last seven years since the crisis, the economy was so weak, um, there's so much concern and risk aversion that the, that the uh, natural rate, the market clearing rate, I believe, went negative. It fell down below zero. And so the, you know, people talk about the Federal Reserve artificially holding rates low. I think they're wrong. I think they're completely wrong. What the Fed did is it followed. You know, so the, the, the market clearing rate is falling below zero. Well, the Fed can take it as low as zero because at zero, if it tries to go below that, and we've seen their central banks attempting this, but if you, if you get, get to zero, at some point below that, people would rather hold cash than earn a negative interest rate at their bank. Now, there's storage costs. So it's not going to be quite zero. Maybe minus two, minus three. But at some point, it'd be better to, you know, storage hold... Storage costs are pretty much upset by the possibility of your house will get broken into. And, you know, it's not a very secure system you it's, have. It's and not. It's are going to find that book on the shelf that's got the fake pages <laughs> right. with your money in. It's incredibly inefficient. That's what my dad does. He has he uses a real book. It's very clever. <laughs> well, not everyone knows, so... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dad changed the Don't location. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> But um, it, it is incredibly inefficient. But, but one way to look at the zero lower bound, which was I described is called the zero lower bound, is it's, it's a price floor, right? Any, any good capitalist worth their salt believes in letting prices you know, reflect fundamentals. They should be against this c- constraint we have called the zero lower bound. Now, we, usually we don't get to it. Great Depression, we hit it. Great Recession, usually it's not a problem. But when it is a problem... Um, we see the limits of the Fed's ability to control interest rates. Um, let, me, let me follow up with this observation. So people have been really critical of the Fed, it's QE programs. And, and I was supportive early on, but I, I've, I've actually grown a little more skeptical of what they actually accomplished. But it seems to me very little. I, I think in retrospect, not a whole lot. I, I think creating some really interesting diagram charts <laughs> with big spikes in them to look, you know, when I look well, at the Fed's balance sheet, it's like, wow, they had to really change the vertical axis there. Right. That's where that's where that's it's, it does make end. some graphing challenges. I, yeah. I, I do think QE put a floor under the economy and it, it helped keep inflation where the Fed wanted it to be. But I, I never I don't believe it could have ever created a robust recovery. But let, let me get to the, this, this observation about the Fed's purchase of treasuries. So people were alarmed or worked up, you know, waiting for hyperinflation. But if you look at marketable treasuries, which is about 13, over 13 trillion now. So you often hear the 19 trillion. That's that's the total public debt, and some of it's held by Social Security, intergovernmental holdings. But the actual marketable treasuries that the government is liable to pay has to pay a real tax burden on. The Fed holds about 18 right now, about 18 percent of that, and that's how much it held before QE. So what's interesting is um, 
during this period I mentioned they sterilized it, uh, its balance sheet. It was selling off those treasuries, and its holdings actually went down quite a bit. So it, people who got worked up over 2000, in 2000 uh, under QE2 when the Fed bought up a bunch of treasuries, well, they should have been e- equally worked up when they sold off all their treasuries. If that's easing, then the 2007, 2008 period should have been massive tightening. But in any event, the Fed holds now about the same number of treasuries as it did before. So the large run-up in public debt, this huge run-up in debt that has people worried, was funded largely by entities other than the Fed. It was funded by foreigners. It was funded by you and me, our life insurance companies, our banks. Um, we're just as responsible for the low rates that you see in government debt and foreigners as the Fed is. So I'm totally mystified by that. So we're going to stop you there. and Let's, let's go okay. a little deeper into it. So... If you look at the data, the interest rate has fallen steadily around the world for a long time. It, it didn't like plunge down and then stay low. It's just a slow decline mm-hmm. in interest rates, I should say, more accurately. There's no single, I hate it when people say it, the interest rate because there isn't one, but uh, there are a lot of different ones for different risks and different types of assets, but they seem to be falling steadily. Uh, you want to attribute that, I assume, to fundamentals. Correct? Yes. And market forces, not the Fed, not central banks, not... Well, mostly market forces. On the margin, you know, the Fed may have, central right. banks may be tinkering, but that's, that, to me, the best case. So how do you understand that? What, 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 what would drive, and in particular, now, when you suggest, or recently, that, and others, you're not alone, a lot of people have argued this, that the market rates, the market clearing rate needed to be negative. What does that mean in terms of fundamentals? How do you understand that in a world where people are, where we have all kinds of investment activity going on all the time with rates of return that are in many times positive in the United States? What's that mean that, that interest rates were close to zero or negative? I, I really well, find what it, it means it, on a personal practical level is there, there's people out there that are so worried, so risk averse, they're willing to give Uncle Sam, you know, $100 and pay me back $95 in the future. You know, I'm willing to, I, I'm so worried about preserving capital, preserving the principal amount that I'm, I'm not worried about getting some kind of positive return on it. Um, so that's not enough. What I really need, now it's true, mm-hmm. I, I can get a positive return if I take a little bit of risk and I can understand a world where people were very risk averse. I don't live in that world, by the way. Most of us don't. Most of people are sitting around thinking, gee, where can I take some risk and get some decent money? Now, I don't want a lot of risk. Obviously, there's a trade-off. Sure. But I don't understand this idea that that people were so risk averse that they just they were willing to just accept low low rates. Doesn't there have to be a change? I know there does. It's a rhetorical question. Has to be a change in people's willingness to borrow or save. And where's which piece of that do you t- use to explain this long secular downward trend in interest rates? Do you see one thing that would cause that would be a a lack of interest in investing. Uh, of a lack of interest right. in risky investing, anxiety about the future. Yes, there were times like that. There have been times like that throughout human history, throughout the last hundred years. And in those times, maybe interest rates were lower, but they don't go down there and stay down there. Eventually, people recover and start taking risk again. Are you suggesting there was a huge increase in savings that that, that drove this? Was this the giant pool of money that you hear in the the National Public Radio version of that what caused the crisis? Sorry. What the savings glut? Yeah, story. I don't I don't understand. Well, that. there's there's where's it coming from? Well, there's there's I think there's several things going on. Um, so there's there is a a longer term trend which you would refer to, and I would call those structural factors. What I was referring to here more recently is more the, the cyclical ones, but the structural ones have been. Um, the world has grown rapidly with globalization, and a lot of these places have, have grown, you know, China, Asia, their income, the Middle East, their income has grown faster than their capacity to produce safe stores of value. They don't have the institutions, the deep capital markets we have that to park their... Now, you're right, my portfolio isn't going to be all just safe assets. It's going to be diversified, but of that portion that I... I Maybe at some point, but when I'm 40, but, 50 years old, it's 30 years old. So. No, right, as you get older. But, it, but for a young person in Asia, there's still some portion of their portfolio they want to preserve that's very safe, and, sure. and they can't find it at home. Um, and so part of the story is, is as, as the world has become more integrated financially, there hasn't been a commensurate increase in financial deepening. They don't have the same markets. So naturally... Places around the world go looking for a safe bank, a safe place where they can hold safe, they get liabilities from financial institutions, and the U.S. is it. They've, as well as some Europe, United Kingdom, Germany, they also provide safe assets. But the world has grown more rapidly as, than has the capacity to produce safe assets. So there's increased pressure on the places that can produce safe assets to, to supply more. 
So the demand for our, our treasuries, that's, that's one of the things going on, I, I believe, is globalization. The other part... Just to, again, to yeah. just pause for a minute, do the, the micro side. As people are demanding more, say, treasuries and relatively, relatively safe assets, mm-hmm. that pushes down the yield that the treasury has to offer on right. a bond. And right. therefore, interest rates are generally going to be lower. Yeah, you, but that's on safe assets. What about the rest of the world? What about building a house, starting a business, all the things that people lend and borrow money for throughout healthy times? Why should that be why, so low? Okay. Well, because the, these safe assets are kind of the basis for all other interest rates. They're, they're you know, we talk about the they tra- anchor it. They anchor. They're, we talk about, you know, what is the key pricing mechanism for financial markets? It's the Treasury yield curve. You always price a few basis points, you know, or maybe it's 100 basis points above whatever the, the, the Treasury gets. You know, or if you get a, a loan, it's so many points above LIBOR, and LIBOR is kind of based on Treasury. So, there's- so if you got the Fed out of the, uh, excuse, excuse me, if you got the Treasury out of the borrowing business, if the United States government mm-hmm. uh, ran a balance budget year in, year out, starting now, a dream for some, a nightmare for others, right? <laughs> So, but if that happened, right. you're, you're suggesting that there wouldn't be a lot of safe assets, right? They wouldn't be available. Um, there'd be a shortage of those. People would be forced to put their money into riskier things. They'd be unhappy doing that. They're not going to just spend, though. I assume they're still going to save. They're going to have, they have to live in the real world where investments are risky. It's a, that's something that happened for, again, most of human history, investments taking a chance on tomorrow, right. and you get a return on your money. Would that have been a, a problem? Would that have been a uh, – would there be a long lo, – uh, excuse me, a long secular trend in falling interest rates in the absence of government – U.S. government treasuries being available? I think there would have, at least for the, the structural components. Um, it, it's an interesting question. I don't know the, completely know the answer. I've, I've thought about this myself. Would they go to gold? What would they – is there enough supply of other assets to be considered safe? We had this question arise in the late 90s when we ran budget surpluses. There were people kind of freaking out. Oh, what are we going to do without Treasury securities? Um, but there is, there is this. I don't get that. I find that mysterious and weird. Well, I mean, I understand it's nice to have a, yes. a, a sugar daddy or a, a safe home or a sanctuary, but it's, fa- it's fake, first of all, because the U.S. government could, could go bankrupt. It's not literally safe, right? And it's, it's comparatively safe. It's, it's safer than any corporation on the planet. It, it, has, it has the ability and the resources far greater than... Power the gun, yeah. The gun, right. in tax space, it absolutely yeah. it does. Um, but, but, but institutions, relatively. I guess let me step so back. The, these, so we have um, you know, the globalization, also aging dem- demographics is also part of the story, I think, long term. Um, China has, a, is slowly, is, uh, if you've been reading, has the demographic issues as well as the U.S. and Europe. Those are kind of the long-term structural stories. And then you have the crisis in 2008. So I've, I've shown this picture on my blog and other places, and other people have reproduced it. But since 2008, that, that descent has accelerated. So it's, it's going to even sh- sharper. So, you know, Switzerland right now, like a 10-year, is close to minus 0.25%. It's, it's hard to fathom a 10-year. Tr- uh, Germany, it's close to like 0.20%. I mean, there's really low yields over there. Um, so it, it is, at one level, it's very puzzling how these people are, why people are so willing to embrace this, but apparently there is. I, I do want to mention, though, that these, these safe assets are not just people wanting a safe store of value. There's also a place for them in, in the shadow banking system, what I would call institutional money uh, markets. So they effectively function as money. So Gary Gordon tells a story, and I, I kind of buy into this, his story, that we had this run on the shadow banking system. Um, people began to question what was behind their repos, what was behind these, you know, these mortgage-backed securities were playing the role of treasuries, and they, they panicked, they ran. And there was a sharp decline in the money supply. When, you, when, the, when the collapse of shadow banking money occurred, it was very similar in spirit to what happened in the Great Depression. The Great Depression was all retail. So right. we have this, so the, these safe Little assets... Bank runs, whereas this is a right, shadow bank run. shadow. So there, there was, a, I think, a money story going on here, too. Another way of saying the safe asset shortage... That kind of pulls my monetary instincts is there's is excess money demand for these these safe assets. They they facilitate transactions for institutional investors, and in the absence of them, now there's there's a, another I think reason since 2008 the crisis. I think there's new, um, new regulations that have made it banks have to hold more safe assets. Um, they could add political uncertainty to some of these discussions. There's a lot of things that have been going on since 2008 that I think have intensified the demand. So let's go back to the – let's try to bring this full circle back to the earlier conversation see if I understand this. And I just want to clarify some of the microeconomics of this um, safe asset issue and if they didn't exist. 
So if they didn't exist, uh, you know, there'd be riskier assets to choose from and a large increase in the world's saving, say, mm-hmm. due to growth, unexpected and large growth in parts of the world that were stagnant before. That's going to push down interest rates across the board for all assets. They're not going to push them down as low as treasuries. But that would be the normal set of events that would happen if if suddenly there were people who were saving more and looking for investment opportunities, then yields would fall over time. And that would be a good thing, not literally a good thing in and of itself, but a sign mm-hmm. of, of that's only an effect, it's not a cause. The cause is the world's getting richer. People have some excess funds for the first time ever in most of their lives. They're looking for places to invest them. And in trying to do so, they push rates down. That's all fine. To bring it back to our earlier discussion, you're suggesting that the mistake that the Fed made is they didn't realize how low those market clearing rates were. They chose to hold the rate, the short-term rate that they do control, above the rate that that would clear the market uh, in the absence of that. Why is that so bad again? I already asked you this, I think, but what's the problem there? What's that encourage banks to do, uh, given that the Fed has uh, made this, quote, mistake? Well, there is a direct and indirect effect. The the indirect one is that it's signaling that the Fed's going to be tight going forward. And that reinforces the panic, the fear. They begin to hoard money. People don't spend as much. So I, I think it sends a signal. And probably the big part of it sends a signal. Expectations. Absolutely. The, more of the direct effect is um, it, it, it's, it, it's putting a, ch- a direct choke on economic activity. If a return on some investment, if I'm a, if I'm a, a firm trying to decide whether to build a new plan, I learned, look at the return on capital. And if it's falling well below the financing cost, it's, it's you know, if, if the Fed has rates up here, and again, this is... In the long run, it's going to lose control of that. But in the short run, if the Fed has rates above you know, what the profitability is on some firm, the firm is not going to build a plan. There won't be jobs. Maybe they'll fire people. So are you arguing that you – know, I, I, you know, I continue to be mystified by the Fed's decision to pay interest on reserves. Uh, I continue to be mystified by the fact that banks are holding massive, massive excess reserves rather than investing them, which is all related to what we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't understand that. And you're suggesting that the Fed encouraged well, – let me, let me try to spin a story and see if you, if you like this because okay. I hear this sometimes. Well, the reason that uh, the banks hold all these excess reserves is they can't find anything to do with them. So until 2008 or so in this crisis, textbook monetary theory, banking theory said, you know, the Fed requires banks to hold a minimum amount of reserves. Of course, they would never hold more than that because they, they don't – they're just sitting there not doing anything. And then so they lend those out, and uh, the claim has been that now that these banks have all these excess reserves, they're going to soon get rid of them, inject them into the economy. That's going to cause the inflation that all the monetary theorists have claimed is is coming. It hasn't, but they they say it'll be coming. And people like you and me, at least I feel like you're going to exempt yourself from this, but we say things like, well, it would have gone into the economy, but the Fed offered – interest on them. So they just sit there and then the Fed's really uh, basically neutered itself. Uh, and they, they, that's the reason quantitative easing accomplished so little. They, they ejected all this cash into the banks and then they encouraged banks not to do anything with it. The skeptic says, yeah, but the rates are so low. It's not really worth it. It's just, a, it's just an extra tool the Fed created. It's not, it doesn't have any real effect. What do you feel about that? I think there's truth in both of those stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Early on, I think the first part of the story is right, that the Fed hit that, introduced the interest on reserves. It was a binding constraint. It, it did encourage banks to put their reserves you know, at the Fed other, as opposed to in the, you know, in the economy. But then the indirect effect would be that, as part of the bigger tightening cycle the Fed was doing, caused the economy to collapse. And as the economy collapsed, then the return on, on capital, profitability, all, they all go down. So I do think if, you know, if the Fed got rid of some reserves, you know, 2010, 2011, it probably you wouldn't have seen an explosion in, in, in lending. Um, the demand for, for, for borrowing just wasn't there because the economy was so weak. So I, I think interest and reserves early on did put a binding constraint on uh, or caused banks to reallocate their fund, their, their, their investments towards the Fed as opposed to the economy. But that helped spiral things down so far that even if that was removed, they wouldn't be interested in, in, in putting those funds to work somewhere else because the, you know, there wasn't demand for those funds in the economy. Is it possible that 
the collapse of the housing market being as large as it was and the backlash on the part of the government in changing credit standards, which they did very dramatically, they, having loosened them to very to absurd levels, they then said, oh, this was, that was a mistake. Now we're going to be very vigilant about who gets a loan and we're going to put a lot of restrictions on banks so they don't make a lot of bad loans. Is it possible that, uh, that there's a micro economic reason that banks are less uh, aggressive with their excess reserves? I mean, the standard story is, oh, they're all nervous. It's like, are you crazy? What do you mean they're all nervous? Economy's doing okay. I mean, it's, a, it's just a ex, you know, ex post it's a story. They're, they're always nervous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody wants to lose their money. Economy's growing. Why aren't they lending the money out? And could one argument be that, well, a lot of what they lend that money out to do is to buy new homes, build new homes. And home building fell off a cliff, stayed on, on the floor. And the government's restrictions on creditworthiness made it very unpleasant for banks to take risks that they normally would have. So there were people who wanted loans. There were banks who would have provided them in the previous regime and even in the regime pre-crazy times. Mm -hmm. But as an overreaction to the credit easing and and credit uh, monitoring that they had imposed before, that that's part of the problem. Oh, absolutely. There's definitely supply side stories going on, I I think. Uh, We we were too risk-loving overall regulators, borrowers, lenders before the crisis and afterwards. I think it swung too far the other way. The, The heavy regulations... Um, it, it, yes, banks are far more careful, far more documentation, all, the, all those things. Um, but on top of that, I, I do think the weak economy uh, and the policies the Fed has pursued since the crisis has also, you know, made banks less than eager to engage. And again, I, I, I view it kind of from the demand for, for loans. Um, they may not be as strong as they otherwise would be had Fed policy been more appropriate. So let's turn to what the Fed uh, should do going forward or what the Fed should do in general, or what the Fed's mandate really should be. The Fed gets, in my mind, way too much attention of uh, treating them as if they do control the economy. So even though I'm sympathetic to your story, to some extent, I really don't like the idea that Mm -hmm. somehow everything depends on wise monetary policy. We get that right, everything's going to be hunky-dory, and if we blow it, we're going to have big problems up and down the asset, you know, the assets, uh, asset market. So, you know, there are a lot of different ideas for what the Fed could have done or what it should do going forward. Where do you, uh, what do you feel about those things like the Taylor Rule or since uh, we're sitting in the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, I hate to use the G word, but, you know, should we think about a gold standard, which like in some circles turns you, brands you, you may just walk around with like poof <laughs> written on your forehead. Um, what are your thoughts on where we ought to head um, going forward, or do you think we should stick with the current system and the Fed just needs to be more vigilant about uh, where they put, put the federal funds rate? I think as a starting place, we need, the, the Fed needs to be more systematic, more predictable, more rule-based. And I, you know, part of the reason we do pay so much attention to the Fed, I mean, I'm guilty. I get on Twitter, I turn on Bloomberg TV, and I'm, I'm live tweeting Janet Yellen's press conference every time. It's, you you know, check your, portf- your investment portfolio off? I, I don't. It's, it's more, I get to hang I'm out. I'm just curious, is this like a systemic personality disorder no, no, no. <laughs> related to financial things? No, I, I don't I, do I think it's, it's because I, I, I found my tribe on Twitter. When, when <laughs> Janet Yellen starts talking, we can speak to each other, <laughs> criticize her and whatever our views. But, so I do think it's important to go more rules-based, systematic approach. Uh, if you look at the, the history of QE or forward guidance, it was made up as it went along. Now, again, maybe if I were in the Fed, it, it, would, have, it would have been tough to maybe be more systematic. But as a guiding principle going forward, we want the Fed to be able to respond in a manner that everyone can anticipate. We don't expect the Fed to know the future, but we should have some idea of what the Fed would do under different circumstances. So more rules basically the first thing. And what does that mean? When you say rules-based. That means the Fed says, look, scenario A will respond in a certain way, scenario B in a certain way. And, and Taylor Rule would be one manifestation of that. So um, the, the Taylor Rule provides, you know, for our listeners, provides a way of, of how the Fed should adjust the federal funds rate in a systematic manner to changes in inflation and changes in how fast the economy is growing. Um, and, it's, and it's been a useful maybe benchmark tool to, to look at, but it has some problems as well. Um, the output gap, which measures how hot the economy is, is imprecisely measured and definitely not measured precisely in real time. 
Um, and so there's a knowledge, part of this is a knowledge problem, Hayek's knowledge problem. Central bankers don't know in real time what to do. So I want a rule-based approach, number one, but one that can operate within the fact that we're ignorant. And I, I think nominal, a nominal spending rule, nominal GDP rule, where the Fed aims to stabilize total dollar spending in a situation where they do that, they're like, we don't know what's happening in the real side of the economy, and we're not going to pretend to know. We're just going to put the economy on a path where total spending grows at a stable path. Now, when it, if you flip to what we're doing today, where they're really focused on inflation, inflation can respond to changes from the real economy, supply-side shocks, as well as demand shocks. And in theory, the Fed should focus just on demand shocks. But in real time, how do you know which is driving what? And, and that's the knowledge problem. And with nominal GDP targeting or total dollar spending, you put aside that, that, that knowledge problem and say, look, we're just going to focus on demand, on spending. And that might mean, you know, one period, if there's rapid productivity gains, maybe things are cheaper, so the spending goes farther. If there's a negative supply shock, oil gets more expensive, there's a war. Well, it's the same amount of spending on fewer things if things get more expensive. But let the markets, the real side, sort out how that spending gets allocated, but just focus on spending. You think of total dollar spending, it's a nominal measure. It's money times velocity. That's what the Fed should be focused on going forward. So let's get in a time machine. Okay. Woo. And we're going to go back to April 2008, and you're a, uh, you're not a fly on the wall in that Fed meeting. You're sitting in the room, and they're saying, everyone's, we've got those minutes. I've never read them. You have. Mm-hmm. Alan Meltzer has. Uh, there might be a few more people, but I know two people have. And uh, they're saying, the people around the room are saying, gee, it's, um, it's scary. I'm worried about inflation. I think we should hold rates I don't think we should we should lower rates. If anything, we might think about raising them. And if we don't raise them, we got to at least mention that we're, we're thinking about it because we wanted to keep that inflation from going off out of control. And of course, as you know, in human history, when inflation has gotten out of control, it's a devastating, sure. destructive economic force. It has a very powerful effect on real activity that's that's horrifying. So that's a good thing to worry about. And it's then they turn to you, David, and they say. What do you think we ought to do? And what would you say and what would you use to justify it now that you're so smart? I don't know about that last part. But what I would say... Smarter. I'd say, based on my time traveling with Russ Roberts, here's what we should do. And I would point out that the current inflation shock is, is a supply-side driven. It's a commodity response. That, that, that temporary spike in inflation was driven by supply-side changes that were temporary. They're going to abate. Even To some extent, the Fed knew this. Um, and I would tell them, look, we need to be more focused on what's happening to spending, on spending. And even if we want to stick to inflation, why not look at what the bond market is screaming at us? So again, and by that time, the break even the expected inflation from the bond market was is falling off a cliff. And it's a, you know, this is not quite accurate. I, I'm going to exaggerate here, but, but it's, it's as if the Federal Reserve is driving a car looking in the rearview mirror at, at you know headline CPI inflation that's high because of commodity prices, as opposed to looking forward. Now, with the market, the market's screaming, there's a, there's a, you know, the cliff ahead, stop, stop, do something. So here's, the, here's the big challenge, right? Here's the hard $64,000 question. So now you would point out a bunch of stuff mm-hmm. that ex post, with the benefit of hindsight, you see gave some indication that inflation was not a problem, right? right? That they were wrong. Uh, I'm sitting next to you in the room, and I say to you, well, you know, we have this knowledge problem. Uh, it's nice. There's some yes. There's some evidence that this is just a supply side shock. But I've got this other evidence which you haven't told me about. But I bet it's out there that says now. Actually, it could be a real. This actually could be a serious uh, problem. That that money has been too loose, even though it doesn't look that way. And and now it's time to start to think about tightening. Which is to say, when it's 2023 and you're the chair of the Federal Reserve and the we won't speculate whose administration is too depressing, but just leave that alone. <laughs> 2023, and all the people who've said for years, oh, we're sitting on another crisis. The crisis comes along, you're chair of the Fed, and you're trying to decide whether to tighten or loosen. You're trying to decide whether to move the federal funds rate up or down. And you've got 9 million data points, which point in different directions. So you're thinking, well, there's a lot of discussion around the room about what to do, and nobody knows. And so you think, well, I'm going to or on the side of caution, I want to make sure I don't have inflation happen on my watch, and you make the same mistake that, that ben, you say Ben Bernanke did. Isn't that a real possibility? It is a possibility. Um, however, I hope by that point, 
will have moved to nominal GDP targeting, and, and, and it, you just have one metric to look at. You don't have to worry about all these other data points. And if we're even luckier than that, more fortunate, we might have Scott Sumner's nominal GDP futures contracts, which would really it'd be the market telling us where things are going, not just you know, actual nominal GDP data. So let's speculate in our remaining few minutes about uh, the pursuit of truth here and, and how we know what we know. And, you know, we're now uh, 80 years out from the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. In the first, I'd say, 30 years out of it, there were a bunch of crazy theories that had, comp- had proponents. Right. Um, they all kind of fell by the wayside, more or less, and were demolished by an extraordinary piece of empirical work by Friedman and Schwartz called Monetary History of the United States that allowed people to seriously claim that it wasn't all that other stuff. It wasn't a stock market speculation. It wasn't the greed of the banks. It wasn't farmers over speculating with land buying. It wasn't whatever your crazy theory is of the Great Depression. It actually was just a monetary failure. Um, And a lot of people believe that. That idea, which you know, I was raised on and many economists raised on is now, I'd say, a little much shakier. A lot of people right now, oh, that Friedman and Schwartz, they just they didn't know what they were talking about. They were wrong, et cetera. We're now 10 years out from almost from the Great Recession. We're going to spend the next 50 years in this uh, so-called social science of ours debating where the problem came from. Do you think that your explanation will gain adherence going forward or will it struggle as many theories have to explain what happened. Well, I'm I think pretty, we'll, we'll make any progress there. I'm pretty sure it'll be a long um, struggle to get this idea articulated. I am hopeful, though, because even people on the left, like Paul Krugman, they, they see the collapse in aggregate demand or nominal spending. They agree there's a, there was a spending problem. The question is what caused it. What caused it? Um, Could it be fixed? Right. Could a, a spending... Collapse be fixed by merely by the Fed saying, "Oh, don't worry, we're going to juice up spending." Oh, absolutely. You know, so that, I, I do see more and more people coming out in favor of it. Um, so there's, I think there's some common ground we can build off of. But on top of that, there's been prominent endorsements of it. Christina Romer came out in front of, for it in 2011. Michael Woodford, probably the most prominent monetary economist alive today, had a speech at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, the, where all the big ideas are often released where he advocated for nominal GDP targeting. Um, there, there's, there have been people slowly making this argument. What I think will be difficult is, is to get maybe a broader support, broader base for this, because because telling the story about inflation and, and money is a very complicated one. I, you know, I play basketball a lot with a pickup group of guys from my church, and and they're always asking me these questions that, you know, oh, interest rates high, low. Isn't, isn't they ask me too, and I even know less. I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's hard. Like the one guy asked, isn't low inflation, you know, something we, we always want? I said, well, it depends. <laughs> and he's like, what? What do you mean it depends? And, and I don't have time. So I think part of our struggle is just to educate that, you know, and maybe this will be a 50, 60 year struggle, but if, if we can get to the point where we can show people that, um, the Fed should focus on their dollar income growth, stabilize their dollar income growth, as opposed to being fixated on how much things cost. I, if we can somehow get the focus shift over there through time, uh, that's my hope. That's the way. I, if we can get there, I think the world will be a much better place. So let me ask you a, a, a trickier, weirder question. Um, you and I probably agree that it would be foolish to hope that... Um, uh, politicians would do what was best for the country rather than making sure they get reelected if they conflict. We would say, well, human beings, institutions, we don't expect, silly to expect things that are not reasonable to expect. We understand public choice. We understand incentives. So our profession uh, would never, I don't think, push relentlessly for a program that would convert the most prominent macroeconomist in the country into something of a robot. Right. There's something really fun about being the chair of the Fed to where, where you're steering sure. this great massive ship with all kinds of dials and, and levers, et cetera. So uh, one of the challenges is this, of this approach is that the proponents of the approach, people like you and Scott Sumner, are on the outside. Right. And suggesting that the people on the inside should behave differently. And, and they're not really so motivated. They kind of like the current system. 
how would you gonna how would you overcome that problem? And I asked that because might it not be better to uh, champion a different monetary system altogether that wouldn't rely on human beings trying to pretend they're robots because they're not so good at it? And there have been people championing alternative monetary arrangements. I think that's an even bigger struggle and even tougher. I mean, I mean, I think Scott and I and even George, we're on a path that's kind of between those two points where it's feasible that nominal GDP targeting could one day be what the Fed targets. Um, it's mainstream. And the, the idea is not novel to us. It's been in the literature for many years. It's in Hayek. It's in, it's in, I mean, it goes back to Hayek, but he, the, it was a prominent discussion in the 80s before inflation targeting came in the 90s. So it's not an, a, a strange idea. There's many people who like it. There's just been some practical questions, how do we implement it, and, and just the inertia of the current system. I, I think there is a way to do this. And if we can get, number one, get to the point where they accept nominal GDP targeting, and then second, if we could go to Scott's uh, idea of futures targeting, at that now there's where I could see some big tension because at that point it does become automatic. It becomes, um, based on his system, futures contracts or the, the Fed sells and buys futures contracts that automatically leads to an increase and decrease in, in the monetary base, which puts things relatively on autopilot. Um, it would make you know certain Fed functions less important. And, and there would be this <laughs> incentive problem that you've talked about, because it would undermine, you know, all maybe the need for vaster research staffs. And, and, and it reminds me a little bit of asking the umpires whether they want to think it'd be better to have a, 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 a computer call balls and strikes, right? Because <laughs> they, they, they do want to get it right. They want it to be accurate. And certainly the computer does a better job. So, but strangely enough, they don't think it's good for the game. <laughs> <laughs> And, right. and many other people don't either, by the way. Uh, but this, I think, would be a different case. I think there'd be a lot of people who'd like to see a different approach. Um, but I can understand that the main people who would market that approach and who would sell it to the American people and the politicians might have a conflict of interest. It's kind of interesting. Uh, you're absolutely right. I, and it's, it, it's quite, frankly, disappointing that we've had gone through a great recession and we're still sticking to the old methods, the old ways. I mean, if you look at the Eurozone, I think they're suffering, too, because of the inflation targeting approach they've taken. I think the Fed as well. So I, I would hope that we would learn from this experience. It doesn't seem we've learned a lot, but there is some signs of progress. Some people are thinking beyond inflation targeting. So going forward, I, I hope we do make progress. Are you optimistic? Um, I, slightly. I mean, I, again, I, maybe not within my lifetime, but uh, maybe. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Friedman Schwartz. <laughs> You know, I don't call that optimistic. That, I, that's very. <laughs> Take the long view, Russ. Yeah. Take the long view. Would you say your children's lifetime? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Within my okay. children. Within you my don't children. Have to go to your maybe, I, maybe I'll be you know a retired professor and with a cane, and I'll be shaking my cane and do my victory lap, you know, around the yard. But I, you know, but I, I think it's going to take a while. I just, I think it's the nature of the beast. It's an institution filled with bureaucrats. There's educating to do. I mean, there's just a lot of barriers to cross. But, but there is, again, there is hope. There is progress. Prominent people are advocating it. Not, it's not a completely new idea. It's just, it just takes time to change that big you know, ship. You've got to slowly move it back towards nominal GDP targeting. My guest today has been David Beckworth. David, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you for having me on. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>